Hello, hello, okay. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Harry. Hello, Quasi. Hello, Kelliana. Hello, Qu hello, thank you. Hello, thank you. Hello, Cabeza. Hello, Lars. Hello, Gabrielle. Hello, hello, oh, that was right, okay. Hello, I said so, hello, Jesse. Hello, Jasmine. Hello, Kat. Uh, hello, Mikaela. Oh, I missed, sorry, yes. Hello, Mikaela, thank you. Oh, oh, and there's, that. oh, God, this is class, yes. Hello, who else did I not say? Oh, Vanietta, hello. Hello, Rahel. Hello, who else did I not say? Oh, hi, I'm doing well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, hey, yes, um, and hello. Okay, cool, cool, okay. Um, oh, and there's more people, sorry. Okay. Um, it's great to see you all. It's always very embarrassing to start this class with a huge clock right on the shared screen that says that I'm starting late. I know it was 4.31 when we started, sorry. Uh, um, we are gonna get rolling. I will admit that there's even more drama than usual on my end. That is, we've had a major internet thing all day and my son is homesick. Um, uh, well, he's always home for this class anyway, but uh, hi, hi, hello, Crystal. Good to see you. Um, uh, um, so I'm sure we are gonna we're gonna have drama today. We will be interrupted and all that. Uh, um, but okay, okay. Um, hi. Uh, hello. Oh yes. Hello, Alejandro. Oh great. Okay, so everybody really is here. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, um, I. I really appreciate how you guys are keeping up with the game assignments. You know, it's a funny thing, those little stupid notes where you just write down what you participated. I don't know if you've noticed, but it actually is a nice little, some of you are making certain things clear to me in those little comments, like, oh, I didn't understand this, but now I do, or I still don't or something. Um, and hopefully it's an easy interchange, but so hopefully some things did get clarified last time about motion two, but I know that I was caught off guard by something. So I, I think I made a bit of a mess of it anyway, and I don't want to do that again this time. Um, there's going to be less babbling, hopefully, and more straight up working. Uh, I mean, less babbling on my part, hopefully. But but I do want to make sure before we, well, I'm afraid to ask this. Oh, hello, hello. I'm afraid to ask this, but does anybody want to tell me what they think the most recent motion, what motion three is, what you did last time with Walters? I will, I will try to keep things con um, unconfusing this time, but what and you could share a screen or not or just share words but what motion what are we up to now do we think and this is not a i mean of course i do talk to walters but i i like to hear it from your point of view professor um, do you want me to share my screen great yes that'd be terrific. thank you oh do i have to take my wait if i have to take my yes yeah, sure um, the one Well, I guess I have to, oh, pendulum swing, wait. Oh, oh, that's what you did. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Wait, I'm gonna take my screen off so that that's just interfering with yours. Okay. Yeah, uh, oh, very nice. Oh, and, oh, and I see what's in the chat. Oh, this is very nice. And I, again, oh, this is yes. And and it's what I was hoping to see. So I don't think I'll be making, I won't be butchering this. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I was hoping you'd say that. This is very helpful, thank you. Um, oh. Do you want me to scroll down or keep it up? Oh, actually, yeah, um, yeah. Per that's perfect right here for at least okay. for the moment. Oh, this is really great because I was hoping you, oh, you guys have really made progress, in fact. Um, okay. Oh, oh. Very nice. So, okay, this time here we're gonna this and you keep it exactly where it is if you don't mind. It's perfect, and I think we're gonna try it a different way this time. What well, I'm gonna tell you guys what I think, like like the and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, and hopefully like in other words, but I find this very clear. Like I, I again I admit that last time there was something about one of them that jostled me, you know. But this is exactly what I was sort of hoping to see. So in this second column here, 
in the second column of the screen share. Am I, is it fair to say the first three, like T is proportional to, T is proportional to, T is proportional to, those were the three, um, you were given those three to evaluate whether each one is true or false, true or false, true or false, right? Is, is, is that, like yes. they're not all true, you're supposed to find out. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I guess I'll cut to the chase. I believe, oh, oh cool. Okay, I'm just looking at the chat. Okay, yeah, and by the way, wait, fair enough, and I'm glad if, we, oh. I'm Sorry, gonna, hold on. No problem, no problem. Um, it's, it's nice for it not to be me for a change, actually. Um, but while she's doing that, yeah, if if Walter's cleared it up, that's great, and then and hopefully, then I'll just push on, and it, you know, maybe you won't need me to clear up anything, and that's cool. But by the way, it that's like, you realize that's the best thing that we could ever hear. Each time any of you says, I, I, you know, hopefully you're being honest, but whenever anybody says it was confusing and now it's not, or even if they just say it to themselves, right? Like that's the best thing that could ever be happening in a class, right? I mean, if it's all, if it's never confusing, it's, it's not worth your money. Like you could have done it yourself, like honestly, right? If something is always clear in a class, that means basically someone's reading you PowerPoints that you could have read in Google yourself. And if something's always confusing, that's a disaster because like nobody wants that. That's not learning. But if things are confusing at first and then become clear, then something is happening, hopefully. Like, I, you know, I'm not trying, but so I'm glad to, I mean, in other words, the brain is actually not just getting more things put in it, but the brain is changing size and shape, hopefully, if things are confusing at first for legitimate reasons and then less so. And so, and, and you know, and so hopefully that is where you are with this. Um, but let, so I'm going to propose to you, uh, instead of testing you, you, you're going to test me. Oh, wait, oh, here comes, sorry. Oh, I just learned. I'm going to, in, instead of putting you on the spot, it's two, A is two. Oh, interesting. A is two. A is two. Oh, A. A is two. I'm not sure I totally understand that thing in the chat but I am gonna actually ignore it for one minute uh, and just say, so that I don't put you on the spot and instead I'm on the spot. My feeling is of those three motions that are put there on your sheet, like T proportional, T proportional, T proportional, I'm assuming or I'm believing that what you found out was that the first one is false and the second one is false and the third one is true. Is that, is that, phew, yeah. okay. Um, okay, so that's good. So we're on the same page there. Okay, and that's awesome. And, uh, if we're like, um, in fact, you know what? In a minute, oh, oh sorry, sorry. In a minute, I'm even going to relieve Kat of her, of her sharing duties. Not quite yet, but in a minute, um, in a minute, in a minute, and I'll start writing things. But, but th this is so nicely presented. Yes, first of all, I agree with you guys that the first two are false and the third one is true. I want to take an extra step to say. This in particular, this lab, when you were asked to find out if things are false or true, that really is not just meant as a wild goose chase or as like a student exercise or something. Part of why the first two are written there, um, particularly the second one, but the one, the two that you proved to be false, it actually is important to know that they're false. Like it actually is kind of a surprise. It actually does tell us something about pendulums. And again, maybe Walters emphasized this, maybe not, but it's not a throwaway. We're not just, by saying those first two are false, it's not just that we're clearing away stupid ideas and getting onto the smart one or something. Like, like um, um, the first one is important to note because it does contrast with a spring. Like, you did find with this pendulum that you studied, presumably it did have some kind of nice steady period, some amount of time that it took to do each cycle, just like we like to believe is true of our masses on springs. Like there's clearly a similarity here that we're trying to take advantage of, that they're both oscillating systems and they both, for sure, we're trying to come to very similar conclusions about both of them. But notice that one of them totally does depend on mass, the spring system, its period does depend on mass, but, but this pendulum one, it does not. Like it, it, it's important to note that it doesn't depend on mass because mass would be the most likely guess coming into a pendulum from everything you just studied with the springs. Like, and if you felt like, if you did guess that mass would be true at all, if, if for one minute you thought that the first statement should be true, then that means you're a good student. Like you would, that means you took something out, correct away from the last um, spring 
unit. I mean, which we're not done with, but so you picked up on the fact that period depended on mass there. What, you like all physicists might then come into the pendulum system and sort of believe that mass should matter. But the reason it doesn't turn out to matter, quick side note, maybe Walter said this, the reason that the period does not depend on mass is because the period depends on fall, like ultimately in a pendulum, something's falling back and forth, right? It's, it's, it's not traveling. I mean, you're releasing it from a certain height and it's falling back to its lowest equilibrium um, vertical position, et, et cetera, et cetera. And the rate at which objects fall, we know from physics one, doesn't actually depend on mass, right? Which itself is already a surprise and sort of interesting, but here we're talking about gravity here. So, okay, so the mass drops out and even though the system is gonna function just like a mass spring oscillator, what's going to determine oscillation here apparently is different. Apparently mass is not one of the driving parameters here. But then second thing on this sheet, on Kat's sheet, on your sheet, where it's, and this is only was more important, um, and I'll write this in my own words in a second, but when we say that it's false, when you have that second motion there that says that T is um, directly proportional to, 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 to square root of theta, and you, um, and all of these were guessing square roots because of the last time also. I mean, I guess that, I'm sure that's evident, but, or, and from your data, mate. Well, no, no, like why Walters would even walk in the room and have square roots here even before you do any data is because we're trying to be physicists and assume that the pattern we figured out from, you know, our last oscillator like means something. So that's why we're guessing all these square roots. But now the second one, when we guess the square root of theta or when we conjecture or posit when Walter says, let's consider and test for theta, that's very reasonable and smart and necessary thing to test for. Like, again, that's not like a student exercise. That is very much the thing we would right away want to study in a pendulum if we're trying to make any sense of a pendulum at all, because that theta thing, which you might even, I wonder if I'm, can I annotate this? No, probably not. I don't even know if, Kat, this might be asking too much, if it's possible. Can you try to annotate and just see if you can add a little like, like not symbol, like a subscript zero right next to the theta um, in the square root, if that makes sense. And you might not be able to, I can't remember, but. Uh, oh, sweet. And just on the other side, the other right side instead of the left side. But that's exactly what that's, um, sorry. That's perfect though. Nice, okay. Perfect, thank you. All right, I'm just asking for that little detail. I just asked Kat to do that. Just because what we really mean by theta here, when, when you tested it and you rejected, you know, theta in general is a variable that measures, you know, at any given moment in time, angularly where the pendulum is. But what you tested for, if you really think about it, is you were testing what is the dependence of period um, on initial angular position, like what I, I believe, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the hypothesis here, the motion number two that you proved wrong, correctly proved wrong, is, is what, you, when you say it's wrong, what you're saying is, I don't care what initial angle I start this thing on within reason, and you probably were all cautioned on this, like within reasonably small angles we're talking about here, for, for sure, if you make the angle big enough, then things start to fall apart. But within reasonably small angles, what we're saying here about motion two is no matter which initial angle I choose, no matter where I choose angularly to place this mass with a velocity of zero and release it from, wherever I release it from, apparently does not affect period. That's what you, right? So that's why I asked for the little naught is just to clarify, like what we're saying is that T apparently does not depend on initial angular position. And the reason I'm making a big deal of that is if we're all in agreement that that statement is false, if that's what you found last week, and again, I do agree with you if that's what you found, then in English, and um, I think I'm gonna write this on the next, this is where we'll, we'll stop the screen sharing in a moment, I think. In English, what that second statement says is period does not depend on amplitude, right? If you think about it, right? Like, like, like for, for, for a pendulum system, wait, I'm sorry, in this class, in this class, I know you know it from other science classes in principle that 
I'm going to stop and ask a question for a second. In this class, have I actually defined the word amplitude? Like, like have I explicitly written out amplitude equals blah in, ever? If not, if, that, if that's a may, wait, did, just raise your hand if you hear me right. Could just everybody just raise your hand if you hear me right now, just so I can, or electronically raise or any kind of raise. Thank you. I totally saw Jasmine thing. I totally saw Kat. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Gabriel. Okay. I love you. This is such a, it's not meant as a power trip that I do this, but it is a power trip satisfied. Thank you. Okay. I just saw a ton of you do that. Thank you. Okay. I can't even name them all. All right. So you are hearing me. So um, good. Thank you. Sorry to be a jerk. So, I think what I'm going to do in a minute, is, and I really do think that Kat did this again. Totally, she should submit it. Not to make a big deal of one part, but she should submit this in any portal that it applies to, whether it's screen. You know, she should get a million points, and so should all the rest of you when you do things like this and bring in your animals and blah blah blah. Nook Miles, something something Pokemon. But I'm now going to now having thanked her, like yay, I'm going to ask. I'm going to share my screen now because I want to give you a strict definition. Thank you very. I totally appreciate it. I'm, ah, I'm almost. Up. Yeah, I'm going to give you now a definition of amplitude in case I did it. And why I'm going to do that is I want to say that that second motion that you just saw on that sheet, I'll rewrite, that second motion, when we say it's false, we are in effect realizing that something very important is true. Like to say that period does not depend on uh, the square root of theta naught is really in English to say that period is independent of amplitude, that the, the amount of time our, your pendulum took to cycle apparently is independent of, does not depend on, is not determined by, cannot be affected by the initial setup of the pendulum. Now, in a minute, I'm going to pause and ask to talk about that. But like, let me first, um, oh God, I'm flying on two boards now. Wait, or, uh, yes, let me share my board and just write out what I mean about that. And then we'll pause. Okay. Oh. 
Okay. Um, Um, we're going to return to, so this is like a comment or remark or whatever I call it, but it's an observation. Well, let me actually, let me, we, and it's going to become a big one. I want to move on, obviously, to the motion that is true about your pendulum. Like, I, I really want to discuss the motion that you concluded to be true. There's a lot to be said about that, but just a quick, but, but this observation is going to come up a lot and is important. So let me just pause and ask, did Walt, did, did this come up in the discussion, this thing that I did? So I'm saying the motion number two, the one that you proved false, is actually in English saying um, a relation, it's saying something about the relationship between period and amplitude. Did Walt, did this come up at all in the discussion? Was it, uh, uh, ah, okay. Oh, oh. Okay, yes. So I just got a question. This just in. Um, no, I just got a question in private chat. This is a very good question. Like someone in the private chat just asked, is the amplitude in this case a constant? Yeah. Actually, it's a really good question. I mean, I want my fast answer is yes. Like my fast answer. Anytime I'm talking about a pendulum doing its thing or a mass doing its thing going back, and and it's definitely not a coincidence that you did one lab after the other. Like Certainly, if you're kind of thinking that you're supposed, if you're believing that you're supposed to be thinking of the mass and spring and the pendulum system as two similar things, you're right. Like they're both examples of an overall phenomenon that we're calling harmonic oscillation here. Um, anytime that one of them is doing its thing, I'm saying yes, amplitude is a constant. So in the case of a, so in the case of the spring, in the case of homework one, a thing on a spring like the amplitude was 15 centimeters. It was literally like how far out we were holding that uh, mass initially. Now, I mean, what, 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 what 15 centimeters really turned out to mean in homework one, I should say this better, the 15 centimeters like that was originally given in homework one, like the, what that ended up being was the farthest that the mass ever got from equilibrium. Like it would never get farther than 15 centimeters on one side or 15 centimeters on the other side. It was doing all of its oscillation between those two endpoints, those two boundary points, those two maxima, right? They therefore constitute the amplitude. The amplitude was like, but it was constant. Like as much as this thing would go back and forth, it, in other words, the mass wasn't always at position 15, but it was always the case that the maximum it could be at would be 15. And that turned out to be the case because that was the initial that it was at. And it always works like that as long as what the initial is, is a point of a place of rest. So in the, in the, in the mass spring system, amplitude was a constant, meaning the maximum displacement from equilibrium. Now, same thing in a pendulum, but here's why this is a good question in the private chat about amplitude. In the pendulum, Amplitude is also a constant feature of any given pendulum doing its thing. If you let a pendulum go from some place, like an angle of, from an angle of 10 degrees or from an angle of pi over 18 radians or something like that, if you let it go from there, then the farthest that you're ever going to find it on that side is eight, is whatever I just said, 18 degrees. And the farthest you're going to find it on the other side is 18 degrees. Like, its maximum displacement from equilibrium will be a constant throughout its swings. It is a constant. Now, here's why I think it was a fair question. Oh, I just, did I just lose? Huh? Oh, 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 thank you. Okay. I, so the person said, so you're welcome, but it's a good question for this reason. Like somebody in the class might even be thinking like, why is he or she even asking that? Like, isn't it certainly a constant? The reason I know I just lost the board, I'm gonna to try to get back in a second. The reason it's a good question why I'm spending a moment on it, because well, it, 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 all questions are good. No, th this is a good question because when you see the entire experiment you guys had to do in order to prove motion to false, you had to try a bunch of different amplitudes. You had to try a bunch of different angles and prove to yourself that even when you changed the angles, the period didn't change. 
you change the angle, you would try one angle. And, well, I, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I believe, and I think, and this time the reason I'm not asking is, I mean, you'll tell me when I'm confusing you. Anyway, what I believe you did was you tried an angle, like an initial angle, like you released your pendulum from like 10 degrees or something, let it go, measured its period, maybe did it a couple of times or whatever, but then you tried a different angle, let that go. So now you tried releasing your pendulum from like 23 degrees and you let it go and you measured the period this time. And then presumably you tried yet another angle. I mean, and I know you can't try that many and it's a simulation and light and all of that. But what I believe you did, if you did this correctly, and if you're, and if I'm making sense to you guys, you tried different angles and found that the period didn't change very much, even when you change the angles. Now, the reason I have to dwell on this so much, the reason it's a really fair question and confusing is if you try different angles, if you were changing your angles, it sure as heck feels and seems like your angle was not constant, right? We have to be very careful. You tried different amplitudes. You varied your amplitude, yet I'm sitting here saying amplitude is a constant feature of, of an oscillator. So there's reason. So let me just try to be as clear about this as possible. I'm not saying anybody's wrong about anything, but if, I mean, the terms constant and variables are super important and they do get very confusing. What I'm saying is in a given oscillator, when a system is oscillating, some things remain, some things are held constant during the operation of that system and others don't. Like some things vary, like a thing's velocity is varying all the time if it's oscillating back and forth. Its acceleration is varying all the time if it's going back and forth. But its rate of oscillation, the amount of time for one cycle apparently is not changing all the time. And its maximum displacements are not changing all the time. When it's doing its thing, certain features are constant. You guys for weeks now have been trying different oscillators. Like you're trying to vary different properties of oscillators to see which one does or does not remain constant during operation. So just, oh God, did I just lose? Okay. Just like with a long way of saying, with a mass on a spring, K, K is a material property of the spring so it can differ from one spring to the next. But once you set up a spring, then K doesn't change during the experiment. So K is constant for an experiment, but you can do an experiment with different springs of different Ks. Same thing here, like, um, uh, like L here is a constant once you put a spring, in, a, a pendulum in motion, but you were trying different Ls to see what would happen during an experiment? Like would changing L affect other things or not? So you're playing with everything to find out really whether it's variable or constant. But once we say something is constant or variable, we mean in the context of like a uh, experimentation using that, that system. So wait, I'm gonna pause for a second um, to get the board back up. And So I think that was a good question. Um, well, oh, let me look. There's more in the chat. Hold on, sorry. Hold on. Right. Oh, okay. So there's a follow up question from someone else now. So, so we are saying something bad. We're here. Yeah, I am saying so. So someone else is asking, wait, am I saying that amplitude is always constant then? Right, right. That, that, and, and yes, I am. If we're using the term strictly the way I just wrote it down on the screen, I'm saying like, once you get an oscillator going, once something is oscillating or is an oscillator, at least of this type that we're looking at, um, then its amplitude will remain constant. Meaning, meaning the farthest it can ever get will remain one number. Like I'm not saying that the object will always be at that number. So I'm not, so mass on, like our original mass on our original spring, its amplitude was 15 centimeters because we started this mass at a distance of 15 centimeters. We started it with no motion whatsoever, like V naught equals zero. We started with no kinetic energy and just all only potential energy at this place called 15 centimeters. We let it go. 
what we do to energy conservation, the thing could never ever, like it will go to 15 centimeters on the other side. And then when it returns, it will return to 15 centimeters because it always have to have the same amount of total energy. So by the time it runs out of kinetic, it's always gonna have the same amount of potential energy. So it, its maximum position remained 15 for, the for its entire performance, its entire behavior. Its position wasn't always 15, but its maximum position was always 15. Hence, we say its amplitude, like the boundary on its motion was always 15. And now I mean that spring doing that thing, its amplitude remained constant. Let me say again, just again, because I think this, it, this is the kind of question that some people in the room might not ask because like they think it's obvious, but once it's sort of asked enough, some people in the room might start seeing there is some, there is something worth looking at here. Like what at least two people in the direct message in the private chat are, are getting at is like, like again, I'm saying when you start an oscillator, once you get it going, some things will remain constant, such as total amount of energy or rate of cycling or amplitude. They'll remain constant throughout its operation in a way that is important and not obvious. Like I say not obvious because I'm saying lots of things don't remain constant. When something's oscillating back and forth, it's accelerations changing all the time. That's very confusing. And like, it's why we have to look at all these other things. It's force is changing all the time. Very confusing. Why we have to look at all these other things. It's velocity is changing all the time. And if you, uh, if you're comfortable with calculus at all, which we want to get into a little bit, like every single derivative of position with respect to time that you can conceive of, whether it's velocity or acceleration or jerk or whip or like Yaverbaum or like whatever, or any, any rate of change that you can conceive of is not remaining constant, not while an oscillator oscillates. Yet I am claiming, yes, two things do remain. Okay, this is where I'm gonna start writing it. I am, okay, so I'm saying that for a given oscillation process, amplitude will remain constant. It won't be the same as for any other oscillation pro Like I could start an oscillator at 15 or I could start it at 12. Like I'm not saying all oscillators in the world have to have the same amplitude. But I'm saying an oscillator, once it starts, it's got to maintain an amplitude. So I think specifically, or I don't know if that's helpful. In the, uh, I'm going to write, okay, yeah, I'm getting eyes. Okay, so so let me get back. I, I need to bring the board back online in. Well, while the board is to make it, why making such a big deal? It, 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 look, if everybody in the room, if, if, and I know again, we're, it's like, you know, physics is about what is simple, not about what's easy, if that makes sense, right? S physics is not, it is simple, but it's not easy. Physics is not about dividing ideas into lots and lots of smaller parts. Physics is the smaller parts from which ideas are composed, right? Like space, like time like mass, the things that are so fundamental that they're really hard to wrap our minds around because there's not a lot to divide up, right? This is often the way physics is. So what am I getting at with this? I'm getting at, why am I even saying that? Besides the fact that my board's not coming on, I'm saying that, oh, so I'm saying that um, if you have in your mind, if you can picture with me that once you get an oscillator going, the rate in which it goes back and forth is, or, or, or excuse me, the amount of time it takes to do a full cycle, this thing that you've been looking at in lab for three weeks, like period, right? Period is constant of a given oscillator. In fact, it's, it's the constant that identifies, it's like the hallmark property or like the, the, the name tag of any given oscillator that you find, whether it's a mass on a spring or a bob on a pendulum string or something like so much about that system is continuously in flux and in change, that the one thing that's steady about it, <laughs> the one thing that's reliable about such a system is its cycling rate, or it's the amount of time per cycle, what we call the period, right? We are, um, and what, you, what we're trying to find for these different oscillators is, what is it that actually determines the period of an oscillator? What is it that controls or predicts or affects or influences like how quickly the oscillator goes back and forth. That's what we're trying to figure out here. You were testing different possibilities. You were asking in, in his lab, in your lab last week, you were basically in effect, 
you had one dependent variable called period, and you're testing different possible candidates for independent variables. You're trying to figure out what cause determines this effect, this very identifying effect called period. And when you eliminate, and again, I'm waiting for my board to come up. I don't know. When you eliminate, I may ask someone to reshare again in a second, but never mind. <sighs> When you eliminate, or when you render false motion number two, you, you, you're, you're saying in your mind, you're acknowledging, okay, any given pendulum on a spring, it has a certain period, like one, two, two, I'm not doing that right, like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, like it has a certain amount of seconds that each cycle takes. Also, it has a certain amount of space that it takes. Like my pendulum, I either started back here at 15 degrees or I started at 20 degrees, but wherever I started, that's going to remain. It's basically constant um, feature. Period is going to remain constant for this oscillator. Amplitude is going to remain constant. But what you're saying when you say that motion number two is false is you're saying that one constant has nothing to do with the other and that is really surprising because one is the space and the other is a time. And we would think that they would be linked. In other words, meaning, and again, I'm still trying, oh, I think I got a board now. Wait. Okay, bear with me, sorry. Thank you. Oh, I guess oh, I already wrote this, but it's okay. Okay, I guess I've written this twice now, but I'm going to go to the next. Tell me if you want me to go back to this board, but I basically just wrote the same thing again. I'm saying that that motion, that second motion that you declared false, if, if indeed it's false, and it is, then that means that the, the amount of time it takes to do one cycle is not at all determined by the amount of distance entailed by that cycle. That is odd. That is what we're saying. We're saying, we're saying,
Okay. I may have made a point of this before, but this is a very, oh, in fact, I, oh, wait, oh, let me just look at, I'm going to look at the chat in a second. I'm sorry. That's funny. Okay. All right. A couple of things in the private chat and one of them is funny and one of them is a very real good way to make sure to understand this. Right. All right. And this is confusing. Okay. So amplitude, so amplitude um, is maximum displacement. So yeah. So first of all, I am saying like, if we're just focusing on our pendulums here, um, wait, oh. Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, focusing on the mass on spring for a second. Like, like, and this is to everybody. I mean, this is because of a question in the chat. It's a very good question. Um, if we look at homework one thing, and by the way, there a new homework is coming. We didn't have homework last week, just to warn everybody. I, I will put, you have a whole week to do it. It won't be bad or anything, but we will have to do another homework sheet after this for next week. But anyway, um, 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 if you're picturing the mass on the spring, from homework one, where we, so we initially held that mass at the 15 centimeter mark, like 15 centimeters from equilibrium. Okay, we let it go. So we held it there at 15. That's where its speed was zero, where its initial place was. We let it go. Now the clock starts ticking and now the mass is moving. And it, so at every single moment now, it's at a different position. like. So the clock strikes one and now it's at 14 centimeters and now the clock strikes two. So it's at 13 centimeters, et cetera, et cetera. So at every moment, its displacement is certainly changing. Its position, its displacement, its displacement from equilibrium, anything you wanna say throughout the oscillation, like the mass on the spring is certainly traveling from like 15 to 12 to 10 to nine. Its position is changing the whole time. But if we watch it do this for a while and we watch it go like this, and we can watch, so we're not saying that it's always at 15, but if we watch it for a while and we say, aha, it's always somewhere between 15 and negative 15, like this is the range of its motion always, then we can't say always its amplitude is 15. Like not that it's always there, but that that's always the limit on where it could be. Kind of like saying my birthday is November 16th. That doesn't mean that I'm saying every single day of my life it is November. And I'm not, I don't mean this as a joke. Like, I mean, to be, um, but because I think there's another confusing aspect of this also, I'll try to address in a second. But like, when I say that my birthday is always November 16th, I don't mean that the day, I don't mean I'm always born or and then it's always the day of November 16th. I mean that no matter what day it is, it will always be true that the day I was born, like my initial position, so to speak, was November 16th. That's kind of what I'm saying here. I'm also saying, but even more to the point, and this may really be what the person is asking me in, in private chat, is that not only my, so if I start off my spring at 15, if I start off my spring at 15, then, and it goes, now its amplitude is 15, like the entire time it's going. What's also true, and here's, again, this is the part that the person might really be asking. What's also true is, I can now stop my spring, like the, the spring from, from homework one, from lab one, like a regular everyday spring. Well, you could imagine me starting it at 15 centimeters and letting it go, but then I could stop it. And we can also imagine somebody starting it at a different place, totally realistic, totally possible. Like even that same given spring, maybe this is where I'm confusing people, even that same given spring with a K of 200 and all the other things the same, Certainly, you have freedom. You can walk, no rule, no, I am not trying to say, oh, maybe this is what someone's asking. I am not trying to say that something about that particular spring stiffness means that it's like good to start it at 15 centimeters. It's, it's not good or preferable or interesting or unique in any way to start it at 15. I just arbitrarily decided to start it at 15. Like, and you know, because 15 is like within reason. I don't want to start, I don't want to break the spring, but I just picked some reasonable non-breaking place called 15 and I started the mass there. And once I started there, then that made it its amplitude for that experiment. But if I stop that experiment and then you come up and you decide to take the exact same spring and start it somewhere else, like at 21, 
Now it's going to swing between 21 and 21. And now the amplitude for that situation is going to be 21, not 15. So what I'm really trying to say to everybody, and this is worth talking about, if anything is worth talking about in physics is like, how do you know when something's a constant or when it's a variable? Like this is like the kind of discussion we ignore for years and years. And that's why everybody gets sunk in science because by the time, like no one realizes it was too late. Like it's worth having this discussion that when I say amplitude is a constant, I mean, once you said it, it's a constant. And that's not an obvious, that, and if I say that, you might think that's a cheat. Well, duh, of course, once you set something, it's constant, but no, because you set the velocity at zero, but you let it go and the velocity changes, changes, changes. And the acceleration changes, changes, changes. But what won't change are a couple of things, one of which is the amplitude. And I need to say again, I'm not saying that you couldn't set up the system with a different amplitude. You totally could. And that is a totally big part of my point. I, there's nothing about that spring that forces a certain amplitude. You could pick whatever you want within reason for that spring. But once you pick it, then it will stay steady in that motion. Uh, does that make any sense? I'm just looking. Yeah. OK. I do. Oh, cool. Thank you. And I wonder, um, any? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but please, I'm gonna try to go slowly for a second. I'm hoping, so thank you, Gabrielle, for saying yes. I'm hope, okay, okay, cool. Cause here's why, again, this is, this is subtle stuff, but the, um, if we're believing that like, it, okay, okay, so therefore, oh, let me, quick question. Have I said the word in this class, have I defined the word parameter for any, did, you would know it if I did. I mean, if I use the word parameter or defined it with a triple equal sign. No, great, good. No, not explicitly, I like that. Okay, no, good. Cause that will clear, I'm gonna do that right now. And I didn't think I had, but that will clear things up now, I think in a way, or, or at least, you know, a lot of times, by the way, your questions are great, all of you. And you notice even these, the, the ones that, I, I get why people are putting them in the private chat. And I hope you see that I'm perfectly delighted to spend time on them. I think they are good questions, but I know that you guys can't necessarily know that until I respond. Like that you might think you missed something somewhere or something, but what you're really doing, you guys, is you're really being careful and you're stopping and forcing me to be as careful as possible with each one of these steps. And that is what's always supposed to happen in physics. It's right, it's, we're not supposed to be rushing, honestly. It is about depth, not breadth. So these questions are clarifying things for me. And now I'm gonna show you sometimes you can think you're confused or sometimes you'll think you don't get an idea but really because especially smart people and you clearly you all of you like clearly your questions are good the reason that sometimes you might think i don't get this is that what's really happening is as a smart person you totally are getting it like you're getting what i'm saying but it seems so obvious you can't imagine like i'm not saying this is strictly true right at this moment maybe or maybe not but sometimes when a physics teacher is talking they're trying to show that everything makes sense and is almost obvious once you think about it. The problem with that is once something sounds obvious to people in a the room, then they can almost be like, yeah, I do get that. So I get it so much. I don't even like know why he's saying, like, I can't even imagine why that's important. It seems so obvious. I don't even see where this is going. So I must be missing something. That's often a reaction we, all, we can all have. What I'm saying, so I'm gonna show you now where this is going. It might help make clear like, why I'm saying it. I'm saying this, so I'm going to define parameter. Uh. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. What we are really saying here, when you say that T depends on square root of L or like on L in any way, we, you know, we have to get back to the square root and all that. But when you say that T depends on L and that T does not depend on theta, what you're really finding, what you're saying is that, oh, the rate of oscillation here or the, you know, the, the, the duration of each oscillation, the time, this, this very important identifying um, hallmark property of the system, you're saying, or let me put it even better. Like the period is the functioning of this system, right? Like whether you've got a mass on a spring or you've got a bob on a pendulum, this thing has one job, which is to go back and forth at some kind of rate. And it, it's, it's starting to turn out to appear that it goes back and forth at some kind of steady rate, okay? So its job is to keep that click rate, um, so to speak, or a tick rate. I mean, like tick tock rate. This thing is supposed to be going back and forth at a certain rate. Um, what we're saying is that rate or that amount, that, that, that period number that we're focusing on so hard, we're saying that that appears to depend on this system's parameters, but not on this system's conditions. We're saying that if you look at, like when you say that T depends on L or in the last lab, when you say that T depends on K and M, right? But you say t does not depend on theta naught, or in the last um, homework and lab, if you say that, if you say, if you say that t, if you say in the last homework that t doesn't depend on the 15 centimeters, or you say here t doesn't depend on whether you pick 22 degrees or 15 degrees as your initial and ultimately maximum displacement from equilibrium. What you're saying is that if just by looking at the ingredients of your oscillator, just looking at the string that it was made of, or looking at the spring that it was made of, you can know immediately how well this thing is going to perform. Like its performance, what is it doing? It's just going back and forth. That's all it's doing. It's like a metronome or something like, like going back and forth actually turned out to be very useful for us because it's like how we keep time in life. Like think of metronomes or I don't know, clocks. That's what this thing is doing. It's going back and forth, back and forth. What we're arguing here really is that the rate at which it goes back and forth, the, the level to which it does its job, its performance rating, if you like, is totally a function of its ingredients, not at all a function of its setup, that the initial conditions apparently don't matter. It doesn't matter how you set this thing up, evidently. It only matters what it's made of. Now that actually is a very big claim. Like if this is really true of a pendulum, if this is true.
put this in as my in the clearest perspective I can, or the most vivid perspective for me, is picture a pendulum. Okay, now picture a really big, like a really big, maybe really reliable, really dazzling, maybe vivid pendulum, like not just a little ball, but a big beautiful chandelier made out of candles or something like that, hanging from an extremely long string or extremely long cord or rope, because because it turns the longer will be the more accurate dangling from some maybe incredibly high ceiling so that we could dangle such long rope, like maybe the high ceiling that you find if you were sitting, like attending religious services or mass or something in, I don't know, say the Sistine Chapel in what we now know is, is Italy, um, in, oh, I don't know, like in the middle of, 17, in the middle of the 17th century, like the year 1610 or something, like uh, clearly I'm going somewhere with this, I'm not just making it up for no reason, but imagine yourself sitting watching a pendulum from the ceiling, if what we're saying is true, about, like in other words, and you can be using a timekeeping device if you want, or you can just soak it in, in your mind. But what we're saying here to, is evidently, if you, if you take that pendulum and you start it at 15 degrees and let it go back and forth, like, and like tick, to, or you probably can't say tick, talk to, oh, you can't see it all, take, oh, you totally can't see, but um, if you if you picture, a, if you let the chandelier in your mind go at like 15 degrees and then let it tick tock swing back and forth and back and forth, um, and then you stop it. And then you picture the next day going back to the same church, to the same chapel, the same huge high ceiling, look at the same chandelier and that, all the same conditions. But now the next day, start that chandelier back at a, say at a, at a drastic angle of 25 degrees. Okay, so the first one was a small angle, initial angle, in other words, a small amplitude that remained constant for that swing. And now you picture another day, the same pendulum, but picture a different amplitude for the same pendulum light, which goes back to the question. Picture this other day starting the pendulum at like 22 degrees instead of 15 degrees. So now this pendulum has a much farther space that it has to travel. It has a much farther arc length it's got to travel for each trip, for each cycle, than did the pendulum from the day before, right? Like one pendulum has a short curve to travel back and forth. The other pendulum has a long distance curve, a long arc length to travel back and forth. So one would think, I mean, I would think, oh, all other same factors, all other same factors, but one day I want a pendulum to tick tock back and forth along like, like, you know, a two meter curved line. And the next day I want it to go back and forth up along three meters of a curved line. So it seems evident to me that the pendulum that I give a larger amplitude to, the pendulum that I set up differently, the pendulum that I start farther back than the other one, I would think it's got a longer space to travel for each cycle. So I would expect that it would take a longer time to travel for each pass. But evidently that's not what I would see if I'm staring up in the Sistine Chapel at these chandeliers as did, for example, Galileo reputedly when he was living and working in Italy in the year 1610 and was sitting in the Sistine Chapel and looked up. Evidently he noticed that the chandeliers were doing what we are saying here, what you guys found with Walters last week, evidently by pulling back the chandelier all the way to 22 degrees and giving it a much farther trip to traverse, somehow I don't cause it to take more time to do a cycle. I don't, because why? This is where I'm gonna stop for a minute, but this could be a lot. Could anybody, I don't know, I'm gonna check back in. I don't know how much you're still with me or you've lost me, but. I'm claiming that you guys are claiming, and you are correct. I am not trying to trick anybody, but I am trying to uncover the fact that what we're saying here is surprising and weird. Like it is worth, like you almost can't get what we're saying until you, for a moment, you see why it should be confusing. And then you resolve it. Like, if that makes any sense. I'm saying now, according to us, farther amplitude swings, like which are possible. I'm saying amplitude remains constant throughout an oscillation process, but you can do an oscillation with whatever amplitude you want. So if you compare two different amplitudes, a large amplitude swing to a small amplitude swing, according to you guys and according to Walters and according to Galileo, apparently we're saying 
farther, like greater amplitude swings don't take more time than smaller amplitude swings. How or why could that possibly be true? How could it be? This is what I'm now asking you, and I will shut up. I'm going to look, and I'm going to be, I'm really going to give you time for, I mean, you might want to even weigh in first and tell me if you understand the question or not. But the question is, how could it be that larger amplitude swings, farther pendulum swings for a given pendulum don't take more time than shorter amplitude swings? That is my question. Ooh, and I just, sorry. That's my question. I'm, so I would like, so I can either repeat it or re-clarify it, but and take time. You can put things in the private chat if you don't want to like jump down other people's throats. But the, I'm asking people to think, you all to think about, we are saying larger amplitude swings do not take more time than smaller amplitude swings. Like that, that's literally what motion two means if indeed it's false, which you are saying and which I am too. But we need an explanation then. How could it be like, like a logical explanation? How could that be true that a farther swing doesn't take more time than a shorter swing. Well, yes. Okay. Now, now, okay. This is good. What Kat put in the thing and totally gutsy and totally, pre what she put is totally right. Like that is, that is totally what I'm saying. It's a hundred percent shows that she's paying attention, that she's in the class a lot. But actually what I'm really trying to do here is flat, I'm trying to show what, like I'm, it's sort of chicken egg. Like, like, I guess I'm asking, how could it be? How could period not depend on amplitude? Like you guys found that it doesn't, that's totally true. It, it's literally, Kat is literally saying the point. The point that we're making is that period doesn't depend on amplitude. But what I'm trying to raise here now with like a, like a mental example is how could, I'm saying, I see that we found that, you found that in your data, but how could that be logical? How could that make sense? How could it be true? Why? There's got to be a reason. And there is a reason. And you do know it, but but not, but I mean, from like two weeks ago. But like, how could it make sense that that if we're asking the pendulum on one day to travel an arc length of like, one day we're asking it to travel 15 centimeters back and forth. Then the next day we're asking it to travel 22 centimeters, let's say. But we're apparently finding that regardless of how far each swing is, each swing will still take the same amount of time. In other words, we're finding that period is independent of amplitude, but how can that make sense? Is what I'm at, like, how, what, how could it be that a farther distance, like if we say that, what we're saying we mean, and again, I totally agree with Kat, like I really like, do. Uh, if we're saying period doesn't depend on amplitude, what we're really saying is amount of time required to make a certain trip doesn't depend on the amount of space entailed by that trip. That's literally what we're saying. We're saying time of each swing, of each round trip swing is a certain number that you're just gonna get from your pendulum. You just got like the square root of L over like square root of G or something, or times two pi or something. It's just some number that you got, no matter whether you brought, like, like this is what you guys found that if you start the string at 15 degrees, you get a certain amount of time to go across and back. But if you start it at 22 degrees, it takes the same amount roughly of time to go there and back, even though you just made the there farther and you made the back farther. So how is it compensating for the time? Yeah, yeah, and yes, yes, this is, I do want to, you are right, absolutely, you, whoever you are. I am right at the moment, not taking into account friction. That's you, and I definitely want to address that. We're not, I absolutely, when we're done, want to address the friction thing, because right, I don't only want this to be true, like in Smurf Village or something like that. Like I do, as a physicist, have to deal with friction. And someone put that in the chat, totally true. Um, but I also want to remind everybody that you did this as a lab. Well, actually, I don't know. I guess it was a computer simulation. I was about to say, look, you all did this in the lab and apparently you got these results. So even with the friction in the lab, you apparently got this. But of course that's a lie because you weren't really in the lab, you were simulating. So I don't even know what you did. So, but yes, for the moment, what I'm saying does not take, um, for the moment, I'm assuming our ball is sort of like heavy enough and non-aerodynamic enough to sort of cut through friction and not make it a big deal. I will totally bring friction back into the discussion at the end, but yes, for right now, what I'm asking anybody in the class, and, and really uh, this, it, I, mean, th I as you, if I spent three hours on this, I would never consider it being off the topic, to, to be honest. And I would never consider it a waste of time as long as people were with me and got something from the end. Because this is a big historical and big physical point. So I'm gonna just say it again, but I am gonna wait till somebody like is with me. 
Like I'm saying, according to your beliefs, and, uh, but, and they're correct, <laughs> but according to what we're saying in this class so far, and again, also, hopefully you're sort of getting the message from me and Walters. I mean, I know this can be super annoying at times, but we don't think of science as a bunch of results or a bunch of conclusions or pieces of knowledge that we are here to give you. You are smarter than us. You and, and you're better at computers. Like if we were here to give you knowledge, you could look it up in Google and we wouldn't have jobs, right? Like, and, and someday we probably won't for that reason. But like what we're here to do actually is show you the process of science, right? Which means actually constantly questioning and not ever accepting anything in science until it actually makes sense. It's not meant to be memorized. It's meant to make sense. And it doesn't until it does. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say again, that's why this all works. So I'm not mad at anybody, by the way. I'm just excited because hopefully someone will get their tuition dollar worth like when we get this all straightened out. I'm saying that it was a mystery. It is, it should strike us as somewhat mysterious and somewhat worthy of thought that our claim that a pendulum swing, a pendulum swing that's big, apparently will take the same amount of time as a pendulum swing that's small, given the same pendulum. So in really concrete terms, what I'm asking is how could it be if I said to you one day I traveled, uh, one day I ran a hundred yard dash, okay? And then the next day I ran a thousand yard dash, but I got the same time for both. Like I tell you that, I say yesterday I ran a hundred yard dash and the next day I ran a thousand yard dash, but I got the same time for both. What must you conclude about my thousand yard dash? Like what did I do? My thousand, how could that be? I mean, I'm claiming that could be possible because I didn't give you all the information in the world. I just gave you the information I gave you. One day I ran the hundred yard dash. I ran a hundred yards. Then the next day I ran a thousand yards, but somehow I clocked the exact same amount of time for both of those races. How did I do it? Like, what did I do in the second race to make that possible? Yes. Oh, well, I'm actually, okay, okay. There was actually a bunch of things, sorry, sorry. A bunch of things just came in in the private chat and the public chat, but what I'm jumping and saying yes to is actually the one in the public chat, okay? When, when, and specific, even let, just speed, period. Not, don't even worry about it for the moment. So I'm agreeing, yes, I'm agreeing with Kat's thing and then, and then Quasi's thing and Gabriel's. So what is that? That means like, ha uh, I have to ask him, but yes, like the, 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 the whatever Gabriel's like, Gabriel's um, agreement confirmation symbol thing that I'm too old to know. Uh, I agree, but it's, it's as simple as the word speed though. We don't even have to get into acceleration or angular or anything yet. I'm saying something, and you really stay with me because I'm not, I'm saying something big, but I'm not saying something exotic or obscure. What I'm saying is I can run a thousand yard dash in the exact same time as I can run a hundred yard dash as long as I run the thousand yard dash faster on average, right? Just that simply. Like you can do a bigger distance in the same amount of time as a smaller distance as long as you do the bigger distance faster. I don't mean this to be a trick. I'm not trying to trick anybody. I'm trying to make a real point, but like speed is distance over time, right? So two different distances can differ and the times can be the same as long as the speeds accordingly differ. So wait, so what I'm saying here in the case of the pendulum is evidently, or what we're all saying, evidently you take your pendulum and you know its length and you know it, and there's no tricks up your sleeve. You, like, you know its length, you know the acceleration due to gravity, whatever. You already know that mass of it doesn't even matter. You, like, you already figured that out. And you start your pendulum at 15 degrees and let it go like a hundred times and measure how much time it took to go a hundred times and then divide by a hundred or like, you know, by 20, whatever you do in the lab. And so you're like, oh, this thing takes like one and a half seconds to do a full there back cycle. Like I held it at 15 degrees, it takes one and a half seconds to do a full there and back cycle. Like it's period is one and a half seconds. If you then take that same pendulum and you start it instead of at 15 degrees, but you start it at, um, at, 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 at 25 degrees, you're holding it back at a farther, at your, you're gonna hold it back at a place that's initially farther from equilibrium uh, than the other one. This is just like taking a mass on a spring and holding it at, you know, not just at 15 centimeters from equilibrium, but say holding it initially at say 25 centimeters from equilibrium. What would happen in either case? It, in either case, we're claiming if you let that thing go now, that second one, the one that you held back farther, if you let it go, we're saying on average, it's gonna travel faster than the one that traveled from just the small amplitude position. 
that anything that's released from a higher amplitude position will on average travel faster by just the right amount to keep the times the same. Now, first of all, now this is something for the class. Why? I believe that you know, I believe that you guys believe me, if you think about it, if I start a mass on a spring back farther, like instead of at 15 centimeters, I hold it initially at 25 and let it go from there. Why would the 25 centimeter mass travel on average faster than the 15 centimeter mass? Like what, what, you know why, I mean, hint, hint, it'd be question four on homework one and question five. Um, oh, it means what that person said basically. Okay, now I know this. Thank you for explaining that symbol. Um, why would something released from farther back travel faster than something not released from farther back? And you, once you hear this, you'll agree, you, you would know this even outside of the physics class probably, but in physics terms, I'm gonna pause on this, why? Why would the, if we had, we let the mass go at 15 centimeters and by the time I got to equilibrium, this is thing on a, you see why the first homework was so important. I mean, we're gonna keep coming back to this. I, I hope you, in homework one, when we released the mass from 15 centimeters, uh, by the time it got to equilibrium, it was going a speed of 3.87 meters per second. Like it got that, that, we figured that out somehow, hint, hint. We figured that out somehow, hint, hint. If we had held it somewhere other than 15 centimeters, we would, if we held it back initially at 25 centimeters, I guarantee you we'd find a much higher speed than 3.87 for the equilibrium position. And we'd find it using the same method we found the speed in question four of homework one. How did we find that speed? Why did something being held at 15 centimeters from equilibrium attain any speed at all by the time? It, like, how did we figure out 3.87 was uh, the answer to question four, like in homework one? How did we find out? the speed, yes, yes, yes. So what, so what Kat said in the chat. So energy is what she, kinetic energy is what she's saying. Here's what I, I'm agreeing. And not because I'm a nice guy. I'm agreeing because it's right. Because I'm saying the farther back you hold an oscillator, the more, the, the, the greater its initial displacement from equilibrium and thereby probably its maximum displacement from equilibrium, it's amplitude. The greater amplitude you give a mass on a spring initially, or the greater amplitude you give a bob on a pendulum swing initially, like the far, the greater angle you give it, what you're doing is starting your system off with greater potential energy, right? Like in the mass spring system, it was one half kx squared. The greater the x was, the greater the one half x kx squared. Therefore, once you let it go, potential energy starts getting converted into kinetic energy. By the time it gets to the center, it has all kinetic energy and, and all of that initial potential gets all converted to kinetic. So it's got a lot of speed. If we had given it more potential initially, it would have more kinetic by the time it gets to the center. So on average, you would have more speed. I'm saying on the one hand, when I think this through and I have to think this through to see this, I'm not kidding. Like, right, I mean, like, obviously I get this now because I've thought it through a couple of times. But it really requires thinking through step by step. I'm saying that actually for any oscillator, the farther back I start it, the greater its initial amplitude. I mean, the greater, yeah, the greater its initial position or its amplitude. The way I set this thing up, the farther I stretch initially, the faster the thing will move throughout cycles that are bigger. So the bigger the cycle I ask this thing to undergo, it just works out by physics laws. I necessarily ask it to go faster. And what's crazy is the fasterness perfectly matches the biggerness. I mean, I'm not kidding. Like the, what the, the math that we're, what we're saying that we're finding here is that the math perfectly works out so that no matter how you try to adjust, now this goes all the way back to circ full circle now. I'm saying you have a given oscillator, it's got certain parameters, certain material properties. Like you lay a spring on the desk, you lay a mass on the desk and you, and you attach them. Or you lay a string on the lab desk and a bob on the lab, you know, and you attach them. And you're like, you write down the ingredients and you measure the things. Okay, you've now got an oscillator ready to go. Your one, the one thing this oscillator is meant to do is, is cycle back and forth at some kind of rate its performance is the extent to which it cycles back and forth at some sort of certain rate. The one thing you can tweak, the one thing that you can play with in setting up your oscillator is its initial 
configuration. It's ampli It's initial displacement. You can play with that. Like that's why it, it's so helpful that you guys, like five of you, in different ways and all privately, but all of you were like pressing me on. Hold on, is the amplitude constant or not? Very fair to be confused about that because what I'm saying is is something slippery. I'm saying amplitude becomes a constant property of the operating system, but you get to choose that constant when you set up the system, just like spring stiffness is a constant of a spring system, but you know you could swap out your spring and put in a different spring with a different spring constant. It's still a constant, but it's a different constant, right? So the amplitude, so there's different types of constants. One type is a parameter that is fixed by the ingredients. Your pendulum, um, it's the length of your pendulum is fixed from the minute I put the string on the table or you put the string on the table. Now that we're setting up the pendulum though, what you have a choice over, the one thing you can play with is how far back to start that pendulum from. And what's bizarre, so you can play with that. You can make the amplitude 15 degrees or you can make the amplitude 25 degrees. But what we're saying here that is stunning really to me is that whichever one you pick won't affect a damn thing in the, in the long run in terms of performance. You can ask for short swings or you, you can ask for nearby swings or far long distance swings, but whichever one you add or anything in between. But because of energy conservation, the pendulum will automatically fall into a speed on average that perfectly compensates for whatever length you picked, whatever amplitude you picked. And therefore, no matter what size, no matter what size in space you pick for each cycle, the pendulum will return the favor with the exact same amount of size in time. The chandeliers in the Sistine Chapel swing back and forth at a basically steady rate, regardless of where they start swinging is what Galileo noticed for the first time in history. Like this, it was first an empirical observation like you sort of made in the lab. He noticed that as he measured the amount of time for chandelier swings, like, and I'm saying he noticed maybe through an hour while he's sitting in church or also he went to church a lot. Like he might've compared to the next day. I actually don't, I mean, I think he did a lot of things to tell you the truth, but, but you can do it any way you want. When you look at a certain chandelier and what we're saying is, what, do it one day when the chandelier starts very near pure verticality, like one degree. Another day when the chandelier starts at like, you know, 20 whopping degrees away from the vertical. And no matter, but if you measure how much time it's taking to do each route, you're going to get tick, tock, tick, tock, no matter what. It keeps time regardless of space. This is what we mean by the word harmonic, ultimately. Why we're calling these oscillators, so let me just write that, and then I will shut up again in a second, but. So oh, that's not, wait, it's not the vice president.
Okay. The independence of T with respect to A, like, so the non-dependence of T on A, by, and by A now I mean amplitude. So I'm saying whether it's amplitude in a pendulum, which you would call like theta naught, or it's amplitude in a mass spring system, which we would call X naught, what, whatever the system is, if amplitude means initial slash maximum displacement, the independence of period on amplitude, the independence of performance on, on configuration is, is literally actually what we mean by harmonic. An oscillator is something that just goes back and an oscillator is anything that goes back and forth. A harmonic oscillator is something that goes back and forth steadily, super steadily. How steadily? So steadily that it's not just steady, it's steadiness that's independent of setup. That's what we mean by harmonic. Literally, lit and, and why this, now this goes so deep. And so, like, oh, and so harmonic oscillator is a clock. I don't just mean is a clock. I don't just mean is like kind of a clock or that you can make simple harmonic oscillators out of clocks or that you can make clocks out of harmonic oscillators. I mean, a harmonic oscillator is the essence of a clock. It's what we mean by a clock. It's the crucial vital ingredient to anything we use to keep time. To keep time means just that, to keep time, right? Now, like, and if you play music, you certainly know what I mean. Like, like a metronome is the essence of a clock. All the rest of clocks is fanciness. Like whether you call say there's 24 hours in a day or 12 hours in a day, or whether you divide the hour into 60 minutes, not like that's all details, right? Or whether you say we're in Eastern Standard Time and California is in, or Texas is in, in Dallas, Fort Worth is in, uh, is in, uh, uh, don't tell me, I know it's the one hour, diff, the, whatever the other one is Central Time, right? Like well, all those things are details. They are not clocks. They are, they are our interpretations and use and flavors of clocks. A clock, in other words, a second does, is not a magical interval of time. And an hour is not a magical interval of time any more than is a meter a magical interval of space. It's just that, it's just an interval of space. What makes time, time what makes a timekeeping device a timekeeping device is that it, it steadily, that it has steady ticks, whether each tick lasts a second or an hour or like some other thing you make up, what you want is the beats, the ticks to be steady. That's what it means to measure time. And here's the really wacky point now, like let's bring friction back into the discussion because at least one person very reasonably like mentioned that in the uh, private chats. Like, like, cause I'm here saying very definitively, I'm saying the essence, like, oh, so throughout, so from the moment that the first mechanical clocks were starting to be made by use of Galileo's discovery, like from the moment we started making mechanical clocks at, um, out of pendulums and, and, and then ultimately gears and springs, like any ingredient that you've ever thought of in any clock, it either there's gotta be springs like in wristwatches or pendulums like grandfather clocks or ultimately electronic processes that uh, we will also see in this class that ultimately do the exact same thing. Somewhere in every clock has to be a harmonic oscillator, something that keeps time without being affected by space. And here's the thing, if you're following at all what I'm saying, and I will again, take a very big breath in a moment, like for real, uh, but if you're following this at all, if you're following that I'm saying that what makes a pendulum really a pendulum is that no matter what angle you started at, it's pretty much gonna take the same amount of time to uh, to to tick, right? Again, we're saying here that the tick tock rate is determined by parameters, not by conditions. It's determined by the ingredients of our system, not by how you set it up. Well, if you believe that at all, then it actually raises a very, then, then okay, it's kind of fabulous. It kind of means, oh, wow, clocks are like really steady. Oh, no wonder, we, oh, pendulums are that steady. That's why we use them as clocks. Well, of course, then the question comes up, well, is everything I'm just saying here kind of all assuming, you know, an imaginary world without friction? Well, yes and no. Like, no, really, actually. What I'm saying actually has very real, it's very important to worry about friction. But what I'm saying actually has very realistic implications because here's the thing. Well,
it, it certainly seems like what I'm saying would assume, you know, that always sort of happens in physics. Like we say these surprise and cool things and it's like, yes, but that's only on paper. It's not really in the real world. So don't get too excited. Well, but no, um, I, what I'm actually saying is uh, if we want to look at the effect of friction, which we should, let's ask ourselves, what does friction do? Like, what is the problem or the annoyance of friction? Well, what friction does is it affects amplitude. It certainly does. Like a realistic pendulum, like even the one you did, well, if you were in an actual lab or if you ever see real, you know, realistic pendulums, whether pr primitive and crude or advanced, like sure, in the real world, a pendulum hangs down and there's there's air um, currents, even due to just air conditioning in the room. And then there's also certainly rubbing between the string and the pole that the string is hanging on. So there's, there's rubbing effects and definitely um, interference from the outside that comes in and does something potentially uh, annoying to our pendulum. But the thing that's annoying that it does For sure. Now, and of course, no matter what I end up saying here, I'm not going to say that anything is perfect. Like the physical world is a world of, of imperfections and uncertainties and finitudes. Like nothing is perfect. But but I do want to convince you all that this effect that we're talking about is actually much, much more reliable than it might you might believe or might like expect in this respect. The reality of friction is friction is real, and friction does um, uh, uh, lead to an imperfection. Like, like, in other words, friction does mean that everything we said in homework one, in question like four and five, like all that stuff we said that the thing will go on an infinite number of cycles, never stop, and it'll always go back and forth between 15 and negative 15 on the other side. Now, if there's actual friction, of course, all of that no, becomes less and less realistic. We can't rely on this thing to go on forever that's certainly true. And another way of putting the same thing, we can't expect it's going to go negative 15, 15, sorry, sorry, 15, negative 15, 15, negative 15 all the time. It's going to like, it's going to, what friction is going to do is decrease the amplitude as a function of time. Like the maximum position actually will start folding down more and more over time. Each swing will be shorter and shorter over time. Um, and, um, I mean, what that's technically called is damping. What's realistically, truly true about realistic pendulums or even realistic clocks is it's absolutely true that as time progresses, and of course, you know, you can make pendulums better and better and you can reduce friction to, you can make the friction less and less, but if there's some friction at all, then over time, each swing will be shorter than the one before, like, like we just said. So over time, a pendulum swing will, pendulum swings will get shorter and shorter. They'll be changing their size in space as we go until eventually we might not see any swinging anymore. So it's true that no clock is perfect, but, but, but think about this. This is the amazing thing. It may seem like I'm trying to fool you into thinking that pendulums are more perfect than they are. But in fact, when most people look at pendulums, they get fooled into thinking that they're less perfect than they are. Looking at a pendulum can fool you into thinking that it's less 
perfect than it actually is. Because if you look at a realistic pendulum, even the one in your lab or whatever, what is definitely true, and I keep saying it because I want to make this subtle distinction, it's definitely true that the amplitude will decrease over time. And you'll see that with your eye. You'll be like, oh, there's all this friction. That's not like a very good pendulum. Like it was going like this, and now it's going like this. So it's losing time, I guess. It's like not working very well. It's not keeping it very steady. But, but that would not be a fair conclusion to come to because, and I don't know if anybody wants to help me out here, but even though you see with your eye that the amplitude is decreasing as a realistic uh, consequence of friction, and so much so that sure, the more, the more effort you put into uh, reducing the friction, like the more you wax the interfaces and stuff, like of course there's lots you can do to reduce friction. And the more you reduce friction, the more you'll see your pendulum not do that as much. So you'll really feel like you're winning and making a better pendulum. But what I'm here to say is, wait a second, wait a second. Even if it's doing it a lot, even a pendulum who, who every swing is having a lesser and lesser amplitude swing, so it looks like a horrible pendulum and it looks like it's really just damping down very dramatically and you know, like too quickly to even be useful. Still, I maintain that's a great pendulum. And I, because, I don't know if I wanna ask, like I maintain, I think I do kind of wanna ask you this, even if friction is there and even if friction is decreasing the amplitude as a function of time, I still say, so what? the frequency, the period, the tick-tock rate is still fine, even though there's friction. And even though we, you're looking at it and visually it looks terrible, I'm saying that doesn't prove at all that, so what? I still say the period is roughly constant as you saw in your lab. I mean, I don't know how much friction there was. Could anybody see why I'm saying this? Oh, wait. Yeah, I'm saying, Right, right. I'm saying what Veronica just said. I mean, it almost seems like a joke. It almost seems like I'm wasting. I mean, of course, I'm so defensive about this all the time because like the more things seem clear to me in physics, the more I feel like I'm not even saying anything in a way. Like I'm just like you, like, but what I'm saying is what Veronica just said. I'm saying, holy crap, even with the reality of friction, which absolutely undeniably friction does decrease the amplitude of an oscillator in time. So it's like, bad and annoying and we want less of it but but even we just got through saying for like an hour that frequency doesn't depend on amplitude so even if the amplitude is going down in time even if the amplitude in other words isn't a constant because of big ugly friction amplitude is still independent of frequency it's even if it isn't a constant, it's not the thing on which frequency depends. Frequency only depends, or I'm saying frequency, period. However you want to say it, it's the same thing. I mean, in reverse. If you guys believe that period is dependent on the square root of the length of your pendulum, or if you believe that period was dependent on the mass of your spring thing, then what you're saying is period does not depend on amplitude. So even, so even whether you change the amplitude, like whether you use one amplitude today for all of your springs, all of your swings, and a different amplitude tomorrow for all of your swings, you could do that. Or you could just take a freaking system and let it go through a lot of swings and let it change its amplitude during, like the whole thing I kept saying for hours is not what automatically happens. But like, even if friction makes it automatically happen, what I'm really saying here is, so what? Wherever the amplitude changes, that does not affect frequency, a period, evidently. So evidently, even with friction on a clock, a clock to a great extent, not perfectly, of course, nothing is, nothing is perfect, but a clock will keep time for long enough to be a timekeeper, even in the real world. That's like why we can have them. Put one last final way, the, the, the two ways I'm saying it is, if you like, is yes, even in the real world, because of friction, stuff like that, even watches do have to be wound occasionally. Like no watch goes forever without winding because we're living in the real world. So yes, over time, even realistically watches and even perfect, I mean, even great electronic ones, all timekeepers lose a little bit of time over time due to friction, but very little. Like, even if you think, Jesus, I have to rewind my watch like every day. This is a horrible watch. Are you kidding me? 
Like you can use that watch for a whole day, like for a whole day, that watch knows what a second is. Like even with the friction of the world and even though you only pay $5 or you stole it from Rite Aid or whatever, like something can keep time for all day before you have to wind it again. That's phenomenal. It, like, and even better than that, even if you have to wind your watch every hour, how about just the fact that you know that it's good for a certain, like it keeps time well enough to keep time for a certain amount of time such that you could just keep a schedule and keep readjusting it throughout time. And then like, you can actually rely on it to tell you what time it is as long to the point where you know it's time to wind your watch. Like, think about it. It's crazy that we can even make timekeeping devices that work at all. They work, they don't work perfectly, but they work so well that they work, that they, and they work well because they are harmonic oscillators. Because even with friction, even with amplitudes going down, amplitude still doesn't drive, period. That's what makes it a timekeeper. And to bring this fully, fully full circle, if this helps at all, what am I saying? I'm saying, eh, wait, I really did have something to say. Wait, amplitude, oscillator, shand, um, System chapel friction. Hang on one second. Um, wind your watch. Oh yeah, yeah. It all comes full circle because I'm saying the first time, like we have analytical reasons for believing this, like more and more math that we're going to do for you to see why we mathematically believe this, but also we empirically believe it because, like, it, it the data seems to suggest it. We didn't expect this. You weren't supposed to. That's why Joe put this as one of your things. You had to actually disprove it. Not because it really would seem provable. It would seem right that the period would depend on the amplitude, but somehow it seems not to. And Galileo noticed this in the church, looking at this, uh, um, I mean, in the Sistine Chapel, looking at the chandeliers, and he noticed it well enough to like build whole understandings of pendulums and of gravity based on this. Like, let me tell you how well he believed, how deeply he believed this. And again, no one had seen this before. Like, you have to be paying attention to this. But once he came to the conclusion that pendulums kept time in this fashion, that it was possible to come up with a mechanical system that would keep time in this fashion, he then, then he be, used pendulums in, at, he made a lab at home and started using the pendulums to measure the time of balls going down inclined planes from which he figured out how gravity worked and a whole bunch of other things. In other words, he started doing physics experiments like physics had been thought about for thousands of years, but no one did controlled physics experiments before Galileo. No one did controlled repeated measurement taking before Galileo because physics is about the motion of stuff through space and time and no one could freaking measure time before Galileo. Like think about, I mean, this is, there's a reason that we've been talking about physics for 2000 years, but no one was doing it as such because we didn't have a clock. But Galileo made a clock out of a freaking pendulum because he noticed this property of pendulums. And here's the most astonishing thing at all, of all, if any of this is making any sense to you at all, the most astonishing thing to me about this is what, it, you know, he noticed the Sistine Chapel thing, right? Okay, big deal. Like Galileo's good at noticing things that nobody for thousands of years before had ever noticed. And notice, he, I'm saying noticed, he noticed. He didn't have a lab in the middle of church like no one had labs, he made up the idea of a lab, but like he wasn't controlling the chandeliers in the Sistine Chapel. He just noticed a trend that was strong enough to suggest him that he should start looking at it more carefully and quantitatively. So he did start watching over repeated trials of the, of the chandeliers going back and forth. And he came to the soft conjecture that he thought they were basically keeping like solid time and then went home and built things out of it and tested and all that. But here's the thing, he watched those chandeliers and noticed that, that no matter how far across they would swing, they always took basically the same amount of time to swing. But if you're really paying attention to what I'm saying, you might have a question, which I'm saying, oh, wait, maybe here's a quick, wait, wait, oh, wait. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, oh, and by the way, sorry, sorry. No, sundial is great. I meant to address that too. So I'm not saying people never had any concept of time. They certainly, no, they did have a concept of time and they could measure it to some extent absolutely with sundials, but two, two, that's a great question. Two quick distinctions I'm making though is, um, is one, I would not call a sundial mechanical. To, and it, and it, this doesn't diminish the question. The question is great, but we did have sundials. And we also, for that matter, we also had hourglasses, to be honest, they were hourglasses. But the, the two big, differ, the big differences between hourglasses and, and what Galileo did from then on with pendulums and oscillators is, 
um, is, uh, uh, well, for two, neither one of them would be called a mechanical device as such, maybe an hourglass, but the big thing with, and a sundial is a huge thing. I love sundials, don't get me, I love sundials, but why they can't be compared exactly to like a pendulum clock is, first of all, as, as you know, the amount, the kind of time that a sundial is keeping is good down to the hour at best, right? Like a sundial tells you what time of day it is. And if you're pretty good at your, if you have a pretty good sundial, you can pretty much tell the two o'clock or three o'clock and maybe let's say, you, at bet maybe you know that it's kind of 2.30 ish, but that's as good as you, you certainly cannot get down to them. And I, it's not a critique of sundials, but I'm just saying if we're then trying to actually start, if, if you can imagine someone rolling balls down an inclined plane, like you guys did in physics 101, like any of these kind of experiments where we start actually on hint, um, releasing the basics of kinematics, like one half AT squared, B naught, anything we know about acceleration and stuff, even to just do a basic enough experiment to get data enough, you need to be able to measure the, like, know it, like the, by the time the sundial ticks, you know, it's half a day later, like you, you that's just not a big, so it's not a precise enough interval um, to make measurements. It's, it's very good to tell you where you are in the cultural, agricultural, religious part of the day, but you can't really do science with a, much science with a sundial. Um, even an hourglass, similar. Hourglass is better than a sundial, but uh, um, um, but it's a very chunky, chunky, um, uh, what do you call it? A very um, crude interval of time that an hourglass measures. And then as a side note too to everybody, just one of the other reasons that it's such a break that we really say that the history of mechanical timekeeping really starts with Galileo, the, the big distinction between the, uh, actually, I'll write, because oh, that's a very fair question, too. Oh, sorry. Okay, here's, it's almost a funny, the, I'm, oh my God. Oh no, okay, yes. I'm really glad that um, some dials were just brought up. Cause right, I, I, I get so excited by these things. I don't want to lie or get over. I can't, I cannot honestly say that the mechanic, that the pendulum clock is the, the first time keeping device ever. No, people have been attempting to keep time in various ways for a long time, but here, but one, but, but there is a big leap, like the bit, what, the leap from sundials and hourglasses um, to these mechanical clocks. One of the most vivid ways to uh, express what a big leap this is, is, is in a very simple sentence that I'm about to write down now that's almost going to sound silly, but is that these clocks, um, that they, they work. on the key thing really the one thing that a pendulum clock actually turns out um to at least become start coming close to doing or at least seem attractive to be able to do something that a sundial can't and a um an hourglass really can't is to keep time while you're on the sea on the ocean um this is a very big deal. I may or may not have time to explain today why, but boats have been around, ships have been around for a long time before Galileo, right? Ships have been around, you know, since ancient times. Navigating by the seas 
whether it's to explore or to um, conduct military operations right, or to defend your land, like the sea, like people have had navies for thousands of years. But the thing that, and people have had exploratory ships for thousands of years, but, but what's always been an incredible, historically, an enormously thorny, challenging problem on ships is keeping time with any precision whatsoever. I mean, you can know the number of days you've been, I mean, even that actually starts to get hard to, you know, people start losing their minds and stuff, but you can sort of keep track of the number of days you've been out there in like the, in the vast Atlantic ocean or something, but knowing what time it is during the day, like a sundial, again, will tell you like 2.30, but, but not nearly precisely enough to accomplish many things that you have to accomplish on the seas. I'm, again, I might or might not get to this in a minute, but uh, there's a reason people have to keep time on ships. And, and the fact that they were not able to until the 17th century posed a limitation on, particularly on warfare, but also on exploration for hundreds of years. Galileo started giving us ways of measuring time that worked on ships. That's partly also why this becomes so historically um, uh, important. Um, just gathering right. Uh, oh, and I, again, I might get to why the ship thing. I mean, the ship thing is crazy. There's actually something very deep going on there. I may or may not get to it in a minute, but before I totally lose my train of thought, there was something I was going to say two minutes ago that is astonishing to me about, I mean, I'm again trying to pick, uh, draw this picture of the man sitting in the church noticing that no matter how far the pendulum swings, it still seems to take the same amount of time to swing. And that that recognition shows that this would be a great ingredient from which to make clocks and start doing physics experiments later. And that all of that is what happens. But Kind of like the question about sundials here. Oh, hold on one second. Kind of like what was put about the sundials here. Um, there's another weirdness to my story. There's something very weird about what I'm saying that makes me happy when I think about it, but it might make you disturbed. Um, like I'm saying, we didn't really have very good or precise clocks. We had some clocks, but not really good or precise clocks um, until we found a system that kept time super precisely. And Galileo found that system when he stared at the pendulum. But what's really weird about saying that, I'm saying Galileo noticed that the pendulum kept the same amount of time no matter, uh, uh, no matter what it was doing. It kept the same amount of time and therefore we can make a clock out of it. But I'm gonna keep saying this until maybe someone catches what the weirdness is. There's a weirdness there. I'm saying Galileo sits there and is like, oh, that's always taking the same amount of time. So, wow, that's a really good timekeeper, which we never had one before. So maybe we can make really good timekeepers out of that since its swings are always taking the same amount of time. There's a problem like with this story, like, like how did he do that is what I'm asking you. Like, or I'm asking you, do you see why there's a, like, I'm saying it's true, it is true, but it's weird that he was able to notice that something was always keeping the same amount of time if he didn't have a timekeeper. Like I'm kind of raising here that Galileo kind of helped us discover or invent the first really good clock of a certain kind by noticing that something was acting like a really good clock. But how did he know it was acting like a really good clock if he didn't have a clock? Do you see what, like how did he know that each thing took the same amount of time if he didn't have something to measure time to that level of precision. You see, well, yeah, actually that pay, and I, and I didn't even mean, yeah, oh, oh wait, oh, sorry. Oh my God, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Wait, and to, you guys just put it in the chat. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, this is the ultimate, sorry, I totally missed it, but that is exactly what I'm saying. Oh, now Gabriel, in some, look, many aspects of time are made up. I mean, and maybe the whole kit and caboodle, like I don't know exact, the difference between what's discovered by science and what's invented, I don't know, that's very, I don't know, time, I think there's a certain aspect of time that's not made up. Like I think there is time and there is space, but the way we subdivide it and count it and do all these things with it, certainly all that we make up and time zones are all crazy. Um, and a minute we make up, but the essence of time itself, of things flowing in cycles, apparently seems to be real. But what you guys put in the chat, no, is exactly my point. It's like, 
wait a second, the whole point is that Galileo discovered the first thing that worked as a good clock, but how the fuck did he know that it was working as a good clock if he didn't have a clock to measure it, right? It is the ultimate chicken egg thing. And this, and I bring this to you, but it doesn't mean he was wrong or that any of this is wrong. I'm not trying to mess with your heads and saying, aha, psych got you. Like, no, this is all the dope. I mean, the straight dope. But I am trying to say, let's really respect how weird and funky science is. It is not straightforward. It's, it is all about chickens and eggs and choices and decisions and leaps and insights and going and going to one step forward, two step back. Like, cause there is no concrete answer. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, there's a concrete answer to what I'm asking. I mean, first of all, it's, <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, I mean, I mean you're, no, clearly. And I, I even know, I know for those of you who are participating in this, clearly you've thought, you couldn't even be following me if you hadn't thought of things like this on your own in other aspects of your life. Like even those of you who are like, whether you're serious or joking, saying this is chicken egg, like hopefully you are a little bit like, whoa, about it. But you you know, I mean, you've all, what am I, well, wait. So one thing is in terms of, uh, in terms of, but no, I'm psyched. If, you're, if you don't know what's real and what's fake at all, like welcome to my world for sure. Um, but like Gabrielle, Gabrielle put, he counted, yeah, actually, he did. He did, just like we sort of asked you guys to do in lab one, or, or no, different lab. He did, but even that now, how could he rely on his counting? Like, he did count, I think that's true. But he had to do some kind of trick or something to give himself even a reason to believe that his counting was like sort of good. And by the way, that's all it was gonna get. This is where the chicken egg thing is. There's no, when I say there's no concrete answer, what I mean is there's not an aha answer like, Galileo actually first invented a time machine, went to the 23rd century, borrowed like an electronic super quantum watch, brought it back. Like, no, I'm not going to say something like that. That'd be cool. But what I am saying is that, um, is that, uh, well, what he did do is he counted, but he had to have some reason to believe that his counting had some reliability. Otherwise, what are we talking about? So he had to do the best he could, which meant he relied basically on two things, natural rhythm of his own body, i.e. heartbeat, which is definitely not perfect, but it is a representation of something steady. And also he probably also helped his own counting by, since he was in church, by taking advantage of music, right? Like he probably counted while he was singing or something. We don't, I mean, nobody, knows, I mean, he made various claims. But the, and, and we know very specifically what he definitely did in the lab, like here, this is all anecdotal, but, but, but one good way to keep time by counting is to be counting while music is happening because that's, the, I, that's what rhythm is, right? But nothing he could have done could have been perfect, no way. All it could have been was good enough. All it had to be, it, and it couldn't even be good enough to prove anything to anybody else, in fact. Like whatever he did, with his heartbeat or the singing could only could not even have been good enough to convince anybody of anything because it is a chicken egg problem. Like why should we, if you're saying the chandelier is so freaking great because you measure with your heartbeat, then aren't you really telling us how great your heartbeat is? Like, isn't that what we should be using for now? Like, what are you talking about Galileo? What he had to do was just use his heartbeat or his singing or his counting sufficiently all what he was looking for, and I'm convinced of this at this age now, this is something I understand, I, as a person, I think I understand this now and I never did before. What I believe he was doing was collecting enough evidence to just feel enough confidence on his own to decide that this would really be worth really looking into and really trying to be as precisely uh, precise as possible and, and then trying to convince other people. He had, he, in other words, what he saw in the, in the chandelier was that there was a there there. He saw that there was something good enough to waste, uh, to risk time on. And honestly, I actually think that is the key to genius. Like, or I shouldn't even say genius. That's the key to real, like wh why certain people end up in textbooks and other, as our heroes and other people don't. Like, yeah, I'm sure he had a really high IQ. I, uh, and I'm sure he had a really uh, higher IQ than I do, honestly. I mean, I think he was probably a genius and I am not, but I know this. I know that there's tons of you in this room that have higher IQs than I do. And some of you may have genius IQs, whether you know it or not, or I know. And, and that's not gonna be the thing that does it. Like it all helps having a high IQ and working really hard helps like becoming great and all that. But what really 
makes Galile what makes Galileo memorable or Newton or these people that we read about in our textbooks. It's not like they literally had one gift that the rest of us don't or something. It's that they had enough of a gift to then have enough faith in their own pre-convictions. They have enough of a belief and a confidence and they're careful enough and they're smart enough and they're gutsy enough to believe enough in a germ of an idea that then they say, you know what? I'm gonna devote a lot to this idea and I'm gonna like sacrifice. I'm gonna possibly like lose my job or I'm possibly gonna fuck up all my relationships with people, which they invariably do these people, these scientists. I'm gonna like mess up my relationships with people, or I'm gonna to totally be scattered about money, or I'm gonna over drink and or under eat. And all of them have a story like that. Like what they end up doing, these scientists that 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 are at least that they are heroic to me, but they're heroic in a very specific way. What makes Galileo Galileo to me? is that he had enough of a confidence in his own ideas not to actually believe his ideas or believe that they were proven or believe that they were right or believe that other people should pay attention to him. He had enough confidence in, in the germs of his ideas to turn his back on a lot of other stuff and take a huge risk in losing a lot of other stuff and risking losing everything because his idea could have turned out to be wrong, right? Like what it is is risk that he would then press and press on a small idea that other people, like other people might have seen the chandelier too, or things like it, maybe even a hundred years earlier or whatever. But then he decides it's just possibly correct enough to go all in, like if it were a poker or put all of his eggs in that basket. And that's hugely risky because it really could have been wrong, right? But that's what I think the nature of science is in risky. And, and again, that's why then he'll end up seeing a lot of things really fast that other people are like, oh my God, he's such a genius. He sees all this that we don't see. Well, it's because he's spending all of his time on that and he's not spending time on other things. And, 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 and you know, I guess I'm saying all of that on a slightly personal level too, because I think that's what you guys, it's important to remember that going through this Fakakata program, I mean, this forensic, this, this, the science programs at John Jay, like, you, especially when it's not quarantined, you guys are sacrificing a lot that your peers in other programs in this college are not sacrificing. I'm sure I've said it before, but I just want to say it again in case it ever escapes your attention, that it doesn't escape my attention. You guys, weekend after weekend, especially if like, you know, it's not COVID and like, and you can see all your friends stuff, like weekend after weekend, most people at John Jay are not or spending it one way and you guys are in the library or in the lab or constantly giving up all this stuff and then getting bad grades or having stress and saying to yourselves like, oh my God, like I'm assuming this is worth it all in the end. I mean, I guess I want this degree or I guess I thought I liked science or I do like science or something, but Lord, this is gruesome. I see people around me not working as hard, not getting as much criticism, not having to spend as much time. Like, and I am, I hope this is all worth it, right? You might often, and every single one of you, if you didn't already, is gonna reach one point. Some, everybody reaches at least one point in this program where they're either about to be kicked out or about to drop out, either they don't think they can handle it anymore. And this is almost everybody, seriously, please know, almost everybody reaches a point somewhere in the program, if you haven't already, where you're like, maybe I even can handle this, but is this freaking worth it? Like, what do I get at the end if I go through this? And, and honestly, what I'm here to tell you is it is and it is. Because the thing about this program is if you do get through it, <laughs> you do get a degree that everybody else in the outside world knows is the kind of degree that a lot of people start and some people don't finish. So if you do finish, you have a degree that is potentially non-finishable by a lot of people, i.e. valuable. Like the degree means something because some people don't get it. Some people try and they can't finish the program and everybody in the world knows that like about certain degrees, not all degrees, this degree, not all degrees, this degree. Some people don't finish. Therefore, if you finish, you have something that's very valuable and meaningful. And what's the trick to finishing? Not stopping, like for real. It means at that moment when you're like, I don't know if this thing is worth it or not. I don't know if I can handle it. Am I the person that can handle this program? You are if you say to yourself, yes, like literally. The way to keep going in this program is every time you're about to not do it anyway, like, and just trust and trust that even if you get a C, 
in a class, which you won't get in this class. But even if you grin and bear it and you get a C in a certain science class, whereas you could have gotten an A in like a justice class or something, know that what you're saying to yourself is, I have a strange feeling that in the real world, a C in a real class is looked upon more favorably and with more meaning by meaningful people with meaningful jobs to offer than an A in a bullshit class. And if you think that, you're right. Do I know everything? No. But, and there are a lot of things I don't know, but that's one risk that I took in my life and it scared me constantly while I was taking that risk. I, believe me, I gave up A's for worse grades because I wanted to do blah, blah, same thing as you. And every step along the way, I was like, is this worth it? And it totally is because I'm vastly underqualified for a job that I love, like, because I shouldn't have this job at all. Like, and I love this job, especially when it's not COVID. Like, it's a whole other story, but it does work. And I didn't know how to do this job the first 85 years I was doing it. I learned on the job like everybody does. But what you first do, okay, this is a long digression. I'm so sorry. But I'm saying that's what Gal, wait, does that make, make sense what I'm saying to anybody? Oh, wait. Uh, Oh, thank you. Okay, I guess it makes sense to one person. Okay, but I really, really do, because I do think this is all psychological. I really do. I think the hard intellectual stuff is actually just hard psychologically. It's all about confidence and blah, blah, blah. And and I, and and believe me, I know what I, I, I've been in the dark places like some of you have and some of you will be. And, and you're doing the right thing if you keep telling yourself this is just worth it because it actually has value. And that's what Galileo did. He went back and checked it out, and um, after you and 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 he, and he after using his heartbeat and singing and his pulse, same thing. Um, he went back in, into the he made a lab basically, and he started turning pendulums into time measuring devices, and then using them to start making measurements of thing going things going down inclined planes, so that he could start finding out things about gravity that had never been found out before. Um, because there wasn't the capacity to. Uh, that's what a harmonic oscillator is. That's what motion two number means. Oh, and then uh, motion uh, number two means now just to, sorry, I've talked so much. I'm gonna, just so I don't leave you, um, actually, yeah, wait, no, I'm not. I'm gonna pause on that. Yeah, I'm gonna pause on that for a second. Um, <laughs> oh, wait, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, here, I'm literally pausing. Let's just let that sing in for a second. Are there, I, if there's any, yeah, that is a lot. So I'm open certainly to any, que any, qu uh, I, I recognize, by the way, that was all about, well, all right, wait, wait, just so that we are landing in a right place. All of that, right, all of that was about T not proportional to the square root of L, uh, sorry, of theta naught. All of that was me making a big deal about one of the motions that you proved false. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna leave us in a total chaos. So for like a brief, very brief amount of time, let's just for a second, remember what's actually true. What you actually proved, your th the third motion, sorry. Um, I believe you came to this conclusion. Uh, wait, did you did you literally say, or am I jumping a step? Uh, no, that's not how you. How did you write your motion three? Does someone want to say? And we're gonna. By the way, we we are. Holy crap! Yeah, I am actually. I I promise. I haven't given you a break like all today and I often haven't given you a break and I've just been babbling a lot. So what I am actually promising is we're just gonna spend like a minute or two nailing down motion three and just trying to be concrete for a second. But then I'm actually gonna let everybody go early. Like we we will go early today and you can remind me, like I think this has been quite enough, but uh, but can you just remind me what you, from that sheet that Kat put up in the beginning, what, what how did you write your motion three? Like, I don't think it looked like this. I think it looked, did, was it like, uh, or could someone? No, that's that's claim five. That was correct. With oh, the oh, five. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, it was correct, but it's number five. But it's claim five. You're saying? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. 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 So you actually did get this far. Okay. No, that's great. Um, uh, 
Uh, it was claim five of motion three. Oh, I, that makes even more sense. I'm sorry. That now I get. It. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. No, it's okay. I was confusing what I said. No, no, you. That's great. Okay, okay. So. And, oh, and claim five of motion three in a way was like the very last claim of motion three, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So, so okay. So this is kind of like your conclusion. I mean, this is like the farthest. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. And every, okay, and I agree with this. By the way, that's the good news. Like, um, and you may not have explicitly said this yet, but to bring this back to where you were a week ago, remember a week ago, all the stress and everything about the motion there was a mass on an oscillating spring system, right? And we went through all of the stuff about proportionality and A and all that. As far as we got there, we got, we got as far as knowing that T was proportional to the square root of M over K. Like we found out by the end of last week that T would be equal to some kind of constant times the square root of M over K. And this week you guys found out that in least in the case of a pendulum, the constant was two pi. So I'm just now, maybe I'm doing something corrupt, but I'm gonna say, and guess what? You can retro, yeah, you, whatever work you did to determine that two pi was the missing constant this week, you can retro apply that as well to last week. And I'm gonna show you, you'll see why in the physics in more lecture material, but, but the summary of where we all are now is like, there's this thing called a harmonic oscillating system. It could, I mean, a simple harmonic oscillator. It could be made with a mass on a spring or it could be made with a bob on a string or it turns out it could be made lots of other ways like electronically or something. But um, uh, well, however you make it, the period, uh, that hallmark of that oscillator is always gonna be some sort of simple, similar, function of parameters. Like in the case of the pendulum, it's the string length and, and, and like gravitational constant. In the case of a mass spring, it's the mass and the stiffness, but you see the parallelism. Um, oh, sorry, this is for a spring. Uh, In both cases, the period is dependent on parameters, not dependent on conditions like we talked about for a lot. Um, and, oh, and period, uh, yeah, I, have to, I keep using words interchangeably. Period is the thing that's the most concrete and easy to observe or measure in the lab, like the amount of time that a cycle takes. But just before vocabulary defeats us, let me clarify and say, okay, so period, right? Period is number of seconds per cycle. When I do square brackets like this, I, I mean like unit analysis. I'm like talking about the units here. So the units of a period by definition are seconds per cycle. Well, we can define something But lowercase f, that's supposed to be a lowercase like script f. Okay, 
again, we're going to sort of wrap like almost here, uh, but just to, all right, what you can measure in the lab most directly is amount of seconds per cycle. You can flip that idea in your mind and talk about cycles per second, right? And literally flip like reciprocal, you know, take the reciprocal of that idea. Um, and, and they really are, they're, they're, they're reciprocals, like both conceptually and mathematically, as in, if it takes me four hours to run around a track, if the period of time that it takes me to do one cycle of the track is four hours, well, then that means I run a fourth of a lap per hour, right? Like if I run four hours per lap, then I run one fourth of a lap per hour or the other way around, if it's easier to see the other way around. Like if I can run four laps per hour, if I run four laps every hour, then that means every lap takes me a fourth of an hour, 15 minutes, right? So they're literally just the reciprocals of each other, just two equivalent ways of talking about the same thing. One is a more useful, easy thing to measure, that's period. But the other turns out to be a more useful thing to um, control. And for example, oh, and I'm sorry. And so the, that, that, so we have period and we have standard frequency. Period is time per cycle. Standard frequency is cycles per time. One unit of standard frequency, one cycle per second is called a Hertz, like as in the name Hertz. It's, it's unfortunate because it sounds plural because of the Z at the end, but it's not actually plural. So one Hertz is one cycle per second. An example of real life application, of course, like if you listen to the radio, like if say you listen to a radio station, 105.9 mega, for example, I don't even know if it still exists, what we really, but, um, if you listen to 105.9 megahertz on your FM dial, broadcasting you from the top of the Empire Steel Building at 105.9 megahertz, like what is all of that? Well, a hertz is a cycle per second, mega is million. So when W blah, 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 says that um, they're broadcasting at 105.9 megahertz, they are literally and actually and truthfully saying that there is some system that is oscillating, that is vibrating, something is going back and forth 105.9 million times a second. Now that ain't no mass on a spring. It is a harmonic oscillator, but it's another, it's an example of another kind that we're going to get to in this class. But so the oscillation is at the root of all these different things in the world. And when a radio station says that they're oscillating at a frequency of hundreds of millions of seconds of cycles per second, they're talking about the magnitude of electric and magnetic fields um, uh, uh, varying that many times per second. Like something is vibrating at that number of times per second, but it's something a little bit abstract. It's, and we're gonna get to it in this class, or we are gonna get to it in this class, but what's, what's vibrating is not, what's oscillating is not even where some object is. It's not even, in other words, the X that's cosigning in the example of a radio station, the X doesn't even stand for how far something is in space from something else. The X there actually stands for the strength or the magnitude of the vector representing electrostatic or and or magnetostatic field at that location. Very abstract. Again, we are going to get to it. So it's not too abstract, but it's definitely not just physical space. It's something else. Point is any number that can oscillate can be described with frequency, amplitude, all those things. And when the electromagnetic fields transmitted by radio stations oscillate at a frequency of 105.9 million times a second, then our antenna will receive that signal um, on our FM dial. And what does FM stand for? Frequency modulation. Modulation is change, frequency is frequency. So um, that's just a quick side example application of where we use the word hertz in real life. But hertz is a measurement of frequency. It is the reciprocal of period. And I really think if that's at all, that's a lot. I'm totally more than happy to, I mean, I'll take any questions or anything that anybody wants to clarify, but I don't need to say anything more. I've said quite, I'm, I'm classes, I'm, I'm, I'm good if you're good, but you let, I mean, I'll answer any questions. Or whatever. And I will post homework in that couple days and it won't be long or hard, uh, but please look out for it. And if you can't do it by next Monday because I don't give you enough time, then that's understood. But uh, but you can just look out for it. But any questions at all about any of this?
Okay. Uh, um, okay. Uh, I know that was all. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Skyla. If that's from right now, thank you. Um, so, if I, I, if you, if any, if each of you could just like shout out a goodbye or, or with V or not, or write a goodbye in the chat, and just then we can all. Go, I mean, I'm into this hello goodbye thing now. I don't know why, but but I'm good if you're good. So I'm saying goodbye. If you, I'll wait till everybody goes to in case their question. But thank you, thank you. That that counts. That's what so thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Skyler. Okay. Thank you, Harry. Good, cool. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Soa. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Goodbye, Crystal. Thank you, uh, thank you, Maga thank you, Kameza. Good. Have a good. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Riley. Good. Uh, oh, I didn't even see you. Thank. Okay, glad you're here. Um, okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good night. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good night. Yes. Good night. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Good night. So you're good, Jennifer.